that your Holy Spirit may descend upon this space and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts may be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the last will be first and the first last. To begin this morning, I have a question that I'd like us to consider for a moment. And that is, how does a Christian know that they are saved? Think about how you might answer that question. How can I or how can anybody else be assured that they are really a member of Christ's body, the church? What is the proof, so to speak, or what is the tangible evidence that gives us certainty that we are truly forgiven of our sins, as God's word tells us? Now, there's two basic answers to this question that you'll hear. The first answer is by far the most popular in America today. And that is a Christian can know they are saved by their obedience and feelings toward God. Are you obeying God in all that you do? Do you have a deep love for God in your heart? Are you meditating upon his word and making it a daily priority? If so, then you can rest assured that you are, in fact, a Christian. The second answer isn't the most popular from the American pulpit, but it's the right answer. And that is a Christian can know they are saved by looking to what God has done and continues to do for us. When we were baptized, God worked through the water and the word to unite us to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we hear the declaration of forgiveness at the beginning of every Sunday service, that is the power of God himself announcing that your debt has been paid by Christ. And when we look to the cross, we see what God has accomplished in our place to redeem us from sin and death. Do you see the difference between these two answers? The first answer directs us to look inward at our actions and feelings toward God. But the second answer directs us to look outward at God's actions and feelings towards us. The problem with the first answer is this. Nothing we do or feel will ever be enough to not need a Savior. Am I obeying God in all that I do? No. And the truth is, none of us are obeying God in all that we do, or else we wouldn't be here this morning. St. Paul says, there is none righteous, no, not one. St. John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's not just from the green book, that's from the letter of 1 John. So what about our feelings? Do I have a deep love for God in my heart? Well, of course I love God. But how deep is deep enough? How do I measure my own love and at what point is it a love that meets the standard of being a real Christian as opposed to a fake Christian? And there lies the problem. When we put our faith in what we do or feel toward God as if that's where we find our salvation, then the gospel isn't out of love. But it becomes a business transaction between two parties. Well, I did this for God, so now God owes me forgiveness. Now, of course, Christians are called to grow in discipleship and bear good fruits for the kingdom. If you're showing up every Sunday after six days of complete debauchery and complete lack of repentance over your sins, then that's, of course, a serious problem that needs serious attention and repentance. But that's not exactly the problem Christ addresses in his parable this morning. Instead, Christ teaches us the kingdom of heaven isn't a business transaction. It isn't a reward we get because we did all the right things for God. But it's grounded in God's complete and over-the-top generosity towards us and all who turn to him, regardless of who or when. For the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, for the past few weeks, we've heard several parables about the kingdom of heaven. 
So I believe it deserves just a little bit of attention as to what Jesus means by kingdom of heaven. Despite what we might assume, the kingdom of heaven doesn't mean just heaven up there or heaven where we're going to go one day when we die. But when we hear Jesus talk about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about a reality in the here and now, a reality that's made known through the preaching and witness of the church on earth. And all those who follow the call of God to live a new life become citizens and laborers of this kingdom. So in order to show us this, Jesus describes the kingdom as a master who hires laborers for his vineyard early in the morning. Now, there's a few things to keep in mind about this setting. In the time of Jesus, people working in the vineyard in this parable would have been called day laborers. And these were a class of people who were unemployed and didn't have jobs. They weren't able to find steady employment for a variety of reasons. So they would literally stand out on street corners all day, just waiting for someone to come along and hire them to do a job, usually some kind of field work. Without exaggerating, day laborers at this time were in a worse position than slaves. Because even though a slave wasn't paid, a slave was at least guaranteed a meal and a place to live every day. But if a day laborer went long enough without finding work, they could end up homeless and out on the street starving. All this to say day laborers were desperate and hungry people. So when this master comes along and he agrees to hire them for an entire day's worth of work, they would have been overjoyed at this opportunity to earn a denarius for themselves. Are we overjoyed at the work God calls us to do? Do we see our vocations, whether it be our jobs, our roles as parents or spouses or volunteer work, the ways that we serve in the church? Do we see these things as things that we have to do or things that we get to do? Just to give a small example, when I first got married to Laura, it was really, really hard getting up every morning at 4 a.m. with her to help her get ready for work. And after a year of being married, I can tell you it's still really, really hard getting up every morning at 4 a.m. to help her get ready for work. So at the very beginning, when we were first married, when my alarm would go off, I would ask myself, why am I doing this? Why am I getting up at 4 a.m. when I don't necessarily have to? But the answer I would tell myself is, well, it is because I have to. It's the right thing to do as her husband. She makes way more sacrifices for me. It would be selfish for me to sleep in, so it's my duty. I have to do this for her. But with school starting this year, I've been challenged to change that answer to myself. Because the truth is, I don't have to get up at 4 a.m. But I get to get up at 4 a.m. I get to enjoy spending more time with my wife. I get to have breakfast with her. I get to have devotionals and pray with her before she goes to work that day. I get to participate in helping her be the best possible teacher that day for her students. Now, before anyone pats me on the back, Laura will tell you I don't get up every single morning at 4 a.m. to help her get ready. But do you see the difference? No matter how small the responsibility, when we begin to see our vocations not as chores, but as opportunities Christ uses, We open our eyes to how the kingdom is working all around us and between us. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. By the third hour, Jesus means roughly 9 a.m. This would have been three hours after sunrise. And evidently, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this vineyard because the master goes out to hire more laborers at noon, at 3 o'clock, and then finally the 11th hour, which would have been 5 p.m. About the 11th hour, the master went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Keep in mind, for the entire day, Nobody hired this last batch of day laborers, which tells us they were probably the least desirable workers. Perhaps they were older or handicapped, or perhaps they had a reputation for being lazy or bad workers. 
But strangely, the master hires them anyways. Even though he just hired plenty of day laborers throughout the day, he goes back to hire the so-called undesirables. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, remember, the first laborers were hired around 6 a.m. And the day ended an hour after the last laborers were hired at 5 p.m. So when this last group receives a denarius each, the first group assumes, hey, this is great. We're going to get at least 12 denarii for the day. But when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them received a denarius. So they worked a whole 12-hour shift, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and the last group only worked for an hour, 5 to 6. Now, chances are you would probably grumble too. Hey, are you kidding me? You're paying this last group the same amount that you're paying us. It's not fair. These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Now, the time difference isn't the only issue, but these last workers didn't even have to work while it was hot out. So what gives? Can we really see this as fair? As I've mentioned to some of you, I listen to different Christian podcasts while I'm doing chores or driving the car or doing you know, mindless work at home. And a couple weeks ago, I listened to an episode where a Roman Catholic shared his testimony of how he went from being a Satanist to repenting of all that, getting out, and going back to his Christian roots again. So on this podcast, he shared his life story and testimony in detail, how he gradually went from, you know, interested in occultism, and then he got into witchcraft until he was literally full-blown praying and worshiping Satan. It was a dark and disturbing journey for this man. But he was fascinated with Satan as this rebel figure, as this advocate of personal freedom against oppression. But he said the first step in turning away from Satanism was the night that he declared his love for Satan. Because it was that night that he began to realize Satan doesn't want love. Satan doesn't know what to do with love. He can't give love, and he doesn't want to receive love. Satan doesn't want people to give him their souls. He wants them to sell him their souls. He wants slaves. He wants power, and he wants people to owe him something. In other words, Satan doesn't want a relationship, but he wants a business transaction. See how this is the complete opposite of what we see in the master in this parable. The kind of business transaction these laborers are seeking might be a fair and equal exchange for their work, but it isn't love. It isn't generosity that they're receiving. But that's why the master hired them to begin with, generosity. Friend, the master says, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Throughout the Bible, any time a character begrudges God's generosity towards someone else, or any time someone gets angry at God for showing someone else mercy, they usually go off and isolate themselves. Think of Cain, who goes out into the field after God shows favor to Abel. Think of Jonah, who sits alone out in the desert by himself after God spares Nineveh from destruction. And think of the older brother in the prodigal son story, who goes out into the field after his brother returns home and receives a feast. I believe this teaches us an important lesson. When we look at the mercy of God in someone else and think, that's not fair. They don't deserve that because I did more, or I've been a Christian longer, or I'm more righteous than they are. We do the same thing as these characters. We isolate ourselves. 
We isolate ourselves from God's love. We separate ourselves from the generosity that he wants to give us. But remember what happens in each of those stories when they separate themselves. God goes out to meet them and he shows each of them his generosity. He gives Cain a mark to protect him. He gives Jonah a plant to shelter him from the heat. And he beckons the older brother to come in and join the feast with his family. Likewise, God meets us in our resentful separation in Jesus Christ, who makes himself equal to us, carries his cross out into the field for us, and bears the burden of the day upon it for us. He didn't do that because you earned it, church. He didn't do that because it was our fair wage for doing what he wanted. But he died out of love, out of his abundant and perfect generosity to give to all, the first and the last. As some of you know, every Easter vigil, we read the famous sermon of St. John Chrysostom, which borrows heavily from today's parable. So I hope you'll forgive me in just reading a small portion of that parable about uh, seven months early. Those who have toiled, St. John says, since the first hour, let them now receive their just reward. If any have come after the third hour, let them be grateful to join the feast. If any have arrived at the sixth hour, let them not be afraid of being too late. For they shall suffer no loss. If any have delayed until the ninth hour, let them not hesitate but draw near. If any have tarried even until the eleventh hour, let them not fear on account of their lateness. For the Lord who is gracious receives the last, even as the first. Come you all, enter into the joy of your Lord. You the first and you the last receive alike your reward. You rich and you poor dance together. You sober and you negligent celebrate the day. You who have kept the fast and you who have not rejoice together today. The table is richly loaded. Enjoy its royal banquet. The calf is a fattened one. Let no one go away hungry. All of you enjoy the banquet of faith. All of you receive the riches of his goodness. Thanks be to God that his goodness and love is not a business transaction. But the banquet of faith is set and prepared already through Jesus Christ. Let no one come forward to receive his supper saying, Lord, this is what I'm owed for being good this week. Or getting up early and coming to church and being a good Christian today. You'll notice everyone who comes forward receives the same bread and the same wine. Whether the king of England walks through that door or the man who once threatened our church, the denarius they receive will be the same. What if your enemy, someone who really, really hurt you and offended you, walked into this church one Sunday? What if they confessed their sins like you and reached out their hand in fellowship saying, peace be with you? Would we welcome them or would we begrudge God's generosity? May we not be found alone in the field, but may we join the rich feast of generosity for the first and the last laid out by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.